On the broadcast tonight, it's been 13 days since a passenger ferry carrying more than 470 people sank in waters off Korea's southwestern coast. From search efforts to ongoing investigation, we have the latest. Speculation is running high that North Korea may soon make good on its threat to carry out another nuclear test. And on the crisis in Ukraine, the U.S. and other G7 states look set to intensify Russia's sanctions. Early edition at 6 begins now. It's 5 a.m. in New York, noon in Kiev, and 6 on a Monday evening here in Seoul. This is Early Edition at 6, live from Seoul. I'm Moon gon -yong. And I'm Sean Lim. Thank you so much for joining us for the newscast. It's been almost two weeks now since the tragic Soho ferry disaster put the nation in a state of shock and sorrow. The number of confirmed deaths currently stands at 189, while 113 other is mostly high school students remain missing and are presumed dead. For the latest, we go over to our Kwon Soa, who is standing by at the news center. So, Soa, not much progress to speak of with regard to the search in recent days. That's right, Sean. But before we get to that, a few minutes ago, we received a report about the last text message sent from the ship. It was from a student and was sent at 10.17 a.m. on the day of the accident, around two hours after the incident was first reported. And by that time, the ship had capsized by 90 degrees. Now, back to the latest of the search operations. Rescue crews have had a hard time with the harsh weather conditions. Only one body has been recovered to Today, and that was less than four hours ago. A strong wind advisory in the area was lifted earlier in the morning, but the tides are what's causing trouble, since the underwater currents are much stronger than can be seen above the water. The visibility is also changing on a nearly hourly basis due to the foggy conditions, and that's been prompting officials to suspend searches at various times throughout the day. When divers are in the water, they are mainly focusing on the fourth floor of the ferry where most of the remaining missing are thought to be. So far, around one-third of the 111 cabins have been searched. Now, so uh, uh, earlier in the day, a video was released by authorities that shows the, the actually first moments of the rescue situation. Now, what did we learn from that? Yes, Konyang, uh, that video is very crucial in determining how the first minutes of rescue efforts were carried out, but also in proving that the captain and the rest of the crew were among the first who fled the ship. The center of attention of the nearly 10 minutes of footage taken by a member of the rescue team is the period between 9.43 a.m. and 9.49 a.m. It shows the captain of the Seolho ferry, Yi jun Sok, and his crew fleeing without attending to passengers. The captain was not wearing his uniform or pants as he left the vessel with the help of the Coast Guard, meaning the rescuers had no chance to distinguish him as being the captain. By 9.35 a.m., all 15 crew members had begun fleeing the ship, but as the video shows, hardly any passengers could be seen on the deck of the ferry, which is raising criticism that the crew did not order to them to leave the ship. The prosecution special investigative team is continuing to look for those responsible for the ferry sinking. What's the latest there? 
Yes, Sean, the number of subjects in the probe is increasing. Investigations into the ferry's operator's practical owner Yu Byung-un continue as prosecutors raided four locations in Seoul, Daegu and Gyeonggi-do province this morning looking for evidence of paper companies. Prosecutors say at least three companies fit that description. And this morning, prosecutors also raided the Mokpo Coast Guard station, suspecting officers there of neglecting their duties in the early stages of the rescue. Thank you. The Mokpo Coast Guard has been accused of wasting precious minutes by asking a student who made the first emergency call from the ferry whether he knew the coordinates of the vessel's location. The special investigative team has also arrested three members of the Korea Shipping Association, including the head of the Incheon branch, for destroying evidence in relation to the case. Investigations into whether the Seoul ferry had malfunctioning lifeboats and life jackets on board are also expected to be expanded. It. The investigators believe the products may have been used ever since they were manufactured in May of 1994. This comes as earlier today two lifeboats were found floating near the accident site, meaning they began to work much later than they should have. Normally a lifeboat would deploy automatically when receiving external pressure. Now that's all I have for now, but I'll be back with more updates in around two hours. Well, amid the national outrage over the government's slow response to the tragedy, the president is expected to swing the axe and make sweeping changes to her cabinet. President Park Geun-hye has approved Prime Minister Jung Hong-won's resignation, but wants him to wait until after the ferry disaster has been brought under control. Our Shim Young-gil has more on the expected cabinet reshuffle. Faith in the government has eroded over the past couple of weeks due to its poor handling of the Seoul ferry disaster. With Prime Minister Chung Hong Wan's resignation, there's mounting speculation a large scale reshuffling of the cabinet is on the way to appease public anger and give the Park administration fresh impetus. Political watches say a number of high level officials could get the chop, including Security and Public Administration Minister Kang Byung Yu, Education Minister Son Nam Su, and Oceans and Fisheries Minister Yi Ju Young. A number of ministers have come in for fierce criticism for their misconduct and remarks following the sinking. The ruling Henry Party says a reshuffle will give momentum to reforms in the country to prevent a similar disaster occurring again. A parliamentary committee has decided to deliberate on seven bills related to safety at sea, while the Henry Party plans to propose new bills to eradicate bureaucratic connections with related maritime industries. The main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy is also preparing to unveil its own ideas on how to improve public safety. As the June 4th local elections edge ever closer, President Park's tumbling approval rating could damage the Henry Party's chances. The opposition party is expected to continue attacking the ruling party over Chung's resignation and its mishandling of the ferry disaster. Kim young Arirang News. Meanwhile, memorial altars for the victims of the Seoul tragedy have been set up nationwide in 17 different cities and provinces, and the altars will be open to the public for 24 hours. The memorial altar at Seoul Plaza is officially open to the public from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. However, anyone can pay their respects at other times as well. In a temporary memorial altar set up at Ansan Olympic Memorial Hall, the city hit hardest by the ferry disaster, remains open to the public through Monday. Starting Tuesday, an official memorial altar will be set up at Harang Park in Ansan. The altars are scheduled to remain in place until all of those who died in the disaster are returned to their families. And now Tanon High School resumed classes for all three of its grade levels on this Monday, some 13 days after the tragic ferry accident took the lives of so many of their classmates. The school will provide counseling and other psychological support services to help students grieving for their friends. Pak Ji Won tells us more. A grief-stricken Tanwan High School resumes classes for all grades on Monday. The school has been closed since the tragic ferry accident on April 16th. Only the senior class was in school last week. On Monday, the freshman class and the 13 second-year students who did not go on the ill-fated field trip returned to a school that has suffered a devastating loss. To help students cope with the tragedy, the school offers various kinds of counseling support. 
The special programs will be led by dozens of psychotherapists and art therapists. The 75 second year students who survived the disaster remain on leave and it has not yet been decided when they will return to their studies. The decision will be made by doctors and the students' parents, who will also discuss programs for helping them cope with the loss of their classmates. It is better for them to be together. One of the common programs in a situation like this is to have a camp for the students. The parents of the surviving students plan to have their children participate in such a healing program, which will be staffed by therapists, medical doctors, and education experts. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Digging deeper, getting to the bottom of stories that impact your life, talking with you on air and online, connecting you with experts on the world's most pressing issues, news and current affairs at its best, with Moon Gon Yong and Daniel Che on Early Edition at 6. North Korea is ramping up tensions on the Korean Peninsula and says there is no hope for inter-Korean relations. This comes after the leaders of South Korea and the United States vowed to respond firmly to any North Korean provocation. Arirang's Hwang Sung-hee reports. North Korea has labeled inter-Korean relations hopeless in its first official reaction to last week's summit between South Korea and the United States. On Sunday, North Korea's Committee for the Peaceful Reunification of Korea, which handles cross-border affairs, bluntly criticized President Park Geun-hye, calling her a wicked traitor and a despicable prostitute selling off the nation. It said the outcome of President Obama's trip to South Korea clearly justified North Korea's determination to counter the U.S. by force and settle the conflict with an all-out nuclear showdown. South Korea's unification ministry said North Korea's rhetoric was a violation of an inter-Korean agreement to stop cross-border slandering reached in February. Following Friday's summit talks in Seoul, the South Korean and U.S. leaders vowed to stand shoulder to shoulder against any North Korean provocation. North Korea has been ratcheting up tensions lately, following its threat last month to conduct a new type of a nuclear test. Recent satellite imagery has shown increased activity at the regime's nuclear test site. South Korea, the U.S. and Japan are concerned the upcoming test could be larger than North Korea's three previous tests. The latest rhetoric out of Pyongyang comes as North Korean leader Kim Jong-un revealed plans on Sunday to develop the regime's military prowess for a confrontation with the United States. Experts view the recent escalation in tensions as Pyongyang's attempt to justify itself ahead of its fourth nuclear test. South Korea's defense ministry said last week the North warned of something big and unimaginable for its enemies before April 30th. Hwang sang Arirang News. With concerns growing about another nuclear test in North Korea, South Korea's Foreign Minister Yoon Byung-se will chair a UN session on nuclear weapons next week. Seoul's Foreign Ministry said Monday that Yoon will be on a five-day visit to New York from Saturday to assume South Korea's one-month presidency at the UN Security Council in May. The South Korean diplomat will host an open discussion on the execution of UN Security Council Resolution 1540 next Wednesday. South Korea is a chair country for the 1540 Committee, which was established to prevent the spread of weapons of mass destruction to non-state actors. U.S. President Barack Obama was in South Korea last week for a two-day visit on the second leg of a tour of Asia that's also taken him to Japan, Malaysia and the Philippines. President Park Geun-hye and the visiting U.S. leader held a bilateral summit at Seoul's presidential office, which lasted longer than its initial scheduled time of an hour. The two leaders discussed various issues ranging from North Korea's nuclear threat, economic and trade issues, and touched upon cultural and human aspects as well. 
Well, let's get an assessment of President Barack Obama's trip to Seoul this time around. For that, we are joined live in the studio by Nam Chang Hee, Professor of International Relations at Inha University. Professor Nam, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Well, Professor, let's first start off with your overall assessment of U.S. President Barack Obama's trip to Seoul. Yes, uh, President Obama's visit to Seoul was shadowed by Japanese recalcitrant uh, stance regarding Yasukuni homage visits and the tragic victims of a sunken ferry. Um, but I would like to call it a success because of five major jobs were well done. And they include, uh, first, that the two uh, presidents uh, vote to do everything to deter uh, North Korean provocations. And they agreed to reconsider what time uh, operational control transfer timing and promised trilateral military information sharing agreement among Korea, the US, and Japan. And Rogers FTA and high level TPP was also on the table while they agreed to make their missile defense systems interoperable. So they all made very well. Now, as for North Korea's nuclear program, the two leaders reaffirmed their stance that uh, Seoul and Washington stay united mm -hmm. on the fact that a nuclear North Korea is intolerable and that any further provocation by North Korea will be met strongly by the international community. Mm -hmm. And Pyongyang has since lashed out on, mm -hmm. um, at those remarks. Mm -hmm. Now, was Seoul and Washington's commitment to denuclearize North Korea uh, well represented to Pyongyang? Well. Uh, President Obama uh, told the news conference that, unquote, the U.S. and South Korea stand shoulder to shoulder in the face of Pyongyang's provocations and our refusal to accept the nuclear North Korea, unquote. Um, their concerted efforts will have some effect, definitely, uh, to deter another nuclear test of Pyongyang. But, uh, you know, it's up to uh, Beijing. Uh, whether they, the Beijing uh, puts a meaningful pressure on Pyongyang so that uh, the three countries and China put together uh, have tried to you know, stop provocations. But we, we, we need to wait and see how North Korea will respond in the, in the near future. Well, just a day after the Seoul summit talks, Pyongyang announced that it detained another American mm -hmm. citizen. Mm -hmm. What is North Korea trying to do? Well, uh, Pyongyang has a tradition of using this kind of humanitarian matter for opening a temporary uh, diplomatic channel with Washington through inviting uh, an American envoy to the Forbidden Kingdom. Um, we never know what they have in their mind, but both Korea and so uh, Seoul and Washington uh, seem to be fed up uh, with, um, uh, fed up as President Obama has said, unquote, we don't go through the constant cycle in which provocative actions by North Korea result in dialogue that leads nowhere, unquote. Mm -hmm. Right, so uh, definitely that um, Washington and Seoul will not allow Pyongyang mm -hmm. to use this so that uh, to bring uh, all of them together or for U.S. Uh, North Korea dialogue. That's, mm -hmm. that's uh, de definite there. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about President Obama's uh, reference to Japan's mm -hmm. wartime sexual enslavement mm -hmm. of Asian women uh, during World War II. Of course, he called it horrendous human rights violation. Mm -hmm. uh, now, do you think this comment by the U.S. President will help reshape the Seoul-Tokyo ties with regards to uh, Japan's refusal to face history? Uh, let me uh, quote uh, what President Obama said. Uh, he said, what happened to the women even in the midst of war was a terrible, uh, egregious, and shocking violation of human rights, unquote. He further went that their outcries deserved to be heard, they deserved to be respected, and there uh, should be an accurate and clear account of what happened. The past has to be recognized honestly and fairly, unquote. Well, Japan's immediate response uh, was made by Deputy Cabinet uh, Secretary Kato, who said that it should not be a diplomatic issue. And I think uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, asked for it when he tried to uh, justify his controversial uh, homage visit to Yasukuni Shrine. Uh, personally, I doubt uh, President Obama's remark will make a fundamental shift uh, in the ways Japanese right-wing politicians uh, handled the past history issue. 
Should Seoul extend some omoyari or diplomatic win-win solution? Tokyo, now after uh, the explicit warning of President Obama, might be more attentive to the proposal, I think, and I hope. All right. Well, Professor Nam Changi of Inai University, thank you so much for sharing your insight thank tonight. Thank you for having me today. China has unveiled a set of previously confidential documents that reveal crimes committed by the Japanese military, including sexual enslavement during Tokyo's invasion of China. The newly published book, called Irrefutable Evidence, comes at a time of sour relations between the two neighbors. Kim Min-ji has the revealing details. China has released once confidential documents revealing acts of extreme brutality committed by the Japanese military during its invasion of China, including the sexual enslavement of women and the Nanjing massacre. China's Chidian Provincial Archives released 89 documents, which consist of letters written by Japanese soldiers, newspaper articles, and other military files. The documents have been put together into a book titled Irrefutable Evidence. The Beijing News said 25 documents showed women forced into sexual slavery were from China, South and North Korea, as well as a number of South Asian countries. Another Chinese media outlet said the documents showed that the total number of comfort women came to about 400,000, half of which were Chinese, while more than 140,000 were from the Korean Peninsula. It added that one comfort woman had attended to 178 Japanese soldiers in just 10 days at a comfort station in Nanjing. In regards to the Nanjing massacre, the Beijing News noted that a Japanese newspaper reported that the Japanese military killed some 85,000 people in just three days. It added that Japanese military files showed that the population of Nanjing fell to 335,000 from roughly 1 million between December 1937 and January the following year. One letter showed a soldier referring to killing the people as slicing bean curds. Other documents were related to the transfer of prisoners to the notorious Japanese military unit 731, where brutal experiments on living people were carried out. Kim min Airang News. Meanwhile, over in Ukraine, there are no signs of tensions letting up. In the latest development, leaders of the EU nations and the United States are expected to announce a fresh round of sanctions against Russia this Monday. Our Shin Semin reports. The United States and the European Union are preparing new sanctions against Russia over Moscow's actions in Ukraine. During a meeting Monday, EU diplomats are widely expected to adopt additional measures and agree on a list of individual Russians facing sanctions. The U.S. is also expected to announce new economic sanctions on Russia for its engagement in Ukraine this week. They will target Moscow's defense industry. Deputy U.S. National Security Advisor Tony Blinken said Sunday that the latest measures will exercise additional pressure on the corporate officials closest to Russian President Vladimir Putin. On the ground in Ukraine on Sunday, pro-Russian rebels freed one of eight European military observers they've taken hostage in eastern Ukraine, citing medical reasons, but stated they had no plans to release the other seven. Earlier that day, all eight observers from the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe marched out in public under armed guards for the first time and said they weren't being mistreated. The separates say they'll release the group if some of their own jailed activists are let out. The West has criticized the group's capture and Moscow has said it is ready to help secure the release but hasn't yet taken action. Shin Semin, Arirang News. A series of powerful tornadoes tore through parts of the southern and central United States on Sunday, leaving at least 14 people dead. Officials in Arkansas are reporting at least 13 storm-related fatalities, while a separate tornado from the same storm system killed at least one person in Oklahoma. Many more are believed to be injured. Homes and other buildings have been destroyed, and local emergency crews are sifting through the debris for anyone who might be trapped underneath. Tornadoes were also reported in parts of Kansas, Iowa, Nebraska, and Missouri, although there were no immediate reports of injuries there. Forecasters had warned for days that violent weather would strike over the weekend.
Well, the weather conditions in Chindo near the Seoho accident, uh, we're hearing that continues to worsen. Let's turn to our Michelle Park for details. Michelle. Well, the conditions in Jindal were very poor today for divers with low visibility and the periods of heavy showers, and it's about to get even worse. Now, starting tomorrow, the spring tide periods begin, and this is when the currents in the area intensify. Now, currently, the water temperature around the accident site is at 12.2 degrees Celsius, with winds blowing at uh, 2.0. Six meters per second, and the height of the wave is at 0.6 meters. However, all these readings will increase tomorrow. Now, for the rest of the nation, the rain will continue throughout the night until the late afternoon tomorrow, bringing the temperature down with the highs around 20 degrees. Now, going over to our readings, our tops out at 12 in the morning before reaching up to 20 in the afternoon. Meanwhile, the southern cities such as Daegu and Busan will both peak at 18 degrees. Now, moving over to other regions, Jeju Island tops out at 19, Tokdo at 13, while Mankumgan tops out at 8. Well, that's all I have at this moment. Back to you guys. That brings us to the end of our newscast. Thanks for watching. For our viewers in Korea, have a wonderful rest of the evening. And a great start of the day to those of you in other parts of the world. This has been Sean Lim. And I'm Moon Gan Young. We hope to see you right back here, same time tomorrow. Bye bye.